the four Fs. Fight, flight, fright, and I guess of the fourth one? Gotcha. Sex. <laughs> okay, so the term stress really was, was uh, coined by a chap called Walter Cannon in about 1936, and he wrote The Role of the Motion in Disease. Uh, he was, in essence, the first to coin the phrase stress with regards to medicine. Prior to that, it was basically part of you know, building and uh, structural engineering. However, the term stress now wasn't really used as it is now until about the 1980s, whereas pretty much everything these days you hear is, oh, it's stress. Um, so it's a bit overused now. Um, we're going to be really dealing predominantly with the fight or flight mechanism here. Fright and sex... Um, they are sort of slight anomalies because, in essence, you have two aspects of the body. You either have, you know, the uh, flight, which is the runaway, fright, which is the aggressive side, and the, um, you also then have uh, fright and sex, which actually is a combination of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems at the same time in a weird kind of way. Um, in the case of fright, apparently the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge um, the police are continually pe pulling people off, you know, pedestrians who basically they can't compute the size of the bridge and looking down, and their body literally dumps all the adrenaline in all in one go. The body can't decide otherwise either to fight or flight, and so therefore they stand rigid because the body can't move, and they are the body can't decide one way or the other. It's a bit like a rabbit in the headlights. It sort of does. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Sex, on the other hand, uh, is men and women. They have the opposite approach, but the end result is you're both using both systems at the same time. Uh, in essence, what is going on, according to Sapolsky anyway, he says that in essence, um, a guy um, to be uh, in readiness, shall we say, um, needs to be in a state of uh, flight, or in essence, uh, the sympathetic state, okay? All raring to go. However, to achieve um, uh, orgasm and to achieve his... Uh, relaxed state he needs to be exactly that he also needs to be in essence chilled out so the body in essence oscillates between the two in the case of a woman for a woman to even allow the guy anywhere near her she actually needs to be in the relaxed state but to actually to achieve orgasm she actually needs to be in the uh, sympathetic state to get going so there is this oscillation between the two this is the only time it really happens as far as we know where the body is actually both in the parasympathetic and sympathetic state as in fight or flight and digest and repair at the same time. Energetically very expensive. There is also a myth going that, that people tend to think of that the sympathetic state, as in fight or flight, is energetically very hungry because it involves adrenaline and running, away, running around, whereas digest and repair, the parasympathetic state, somehow is chilled out man and we don't use much energy. This is completely incorrect, is that for your body to digest food takes an awful lot of energy. So therefore this is one of the reasons ostensibly why it's given that the body has to either choose one or the other. And this is also maybe why during sex people get really, really exhausted or light up a cigarette, depending on which way is your preference. Okay? Um, so when we're talking about uh, flight, this is where you have uh, the stress increases blood pressure, diverts flow to the thigh muscles, specifically increases vasodilation, so you've got better blood flow so you can physically run away. It goes downwards. It isn't a whole body thing. It goes downwards, so you can run away. Fight, on the other hand, is completely reverse. You actually increase the blood pressure, leaving the heart so that it goes upwards. You know, it's even in our posture. Flight. You, know, you don't look like that when you're trying to run away. You're <laughs> it's all about your legs. So there is a di differential where, the, where vasodilation happens, where, in essence, the arteries and veins are expanding so that there is more blood, pr blood flow to those areas that you need to use. Predominantly in the case of when you're running away, you need your legs. When you want to scrap, then ostensibly it's mainly your hands. So, fight or flight, sympathetic. Digest and repair, parasympathetic. Um, the reason that, it, uh, to be quite honest, I usually mix these two up every now and again is because sympathetic sounds as though it should be nice and yet it's associated with f fighting and running away. Um, the, uh, the reason it got its name ostensibly is because it was sympathetic to your survival. 
the, nerve, the nerves that, th that gave you the ability to run away or to scrap, in essence, were sympathetic to your survival. And the reason it's called parasympathetic is because the nerves that deal with that were next to the ones that helped your survival, hence sympathetic and parasympathetic. However, I'll be just referring to it as fight or flight, digest and repair, because in this particular context, this is what I'm sort of aiming for. The fight or flight response is incredibly complex. And there's always a yes but attached to pretty much everything I'm going to be saying is because there are always going to be exceptions. Again, I'd refer you to Professor Robert Sapolsky's books. He's written loads of the stuff. Um, the Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, I would say, as a starting point, this is a great book. It covers a broad range of topics. It's really amusing. It's very accessible, even if you have no anatomical knowledge. And he explains it in a really good way, and it shows you how many parts of your body, how many aspects of your body apply to the fight or flight mechanism, how it deals with to the point of even your relationship with food it can be dealt with completely differently biochemically depending on your stress state. If stressors go on too long, they will make you ill. Fight or flight, particularly if we think about that, is only a very short term thing. It is, in essence, the running away from the saber tooth tiger. And you only have a certain amount of adrenaline and a certain amount of energy in your body to sustain that. And ostensibly, it's around about 15 minutes, depending on your metabolism, but it's reckoned to be roughly about 15 minutes worth of sustained adrenaline flight, okay? Or fight, if you like. Any longer than that, then basically you're running on borrowed time. And if you haven't escaped the saber-toothed tiger, well, it doesn't really matter anyway. The reason that it makes you sick, in essence, is continued high blood pressure, because it's what happens is when you get ramped up, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, you increases continued blood pressure means continued stress on your body. This means the muscles around your blood vessels to accommodate the continued raised blood flow, flow in other words, you need to get stiffer because you've got a lot more pressure going through. The long-term downside of this is they will start to become rigid, just like any other muscle you use a lot is that if you're continually going at it, those muscles will get bigger and stronger. Now, in vasodilation, this is no good for you at all, is that it needs to be flexible and movable. If they become too rigid, then you end up getting long-term high blood pressure, is because the vasodilation no longer is working as well as it should be. That make sense? So, another aspect of whether you're in fight or flight or digest and repair mode is that when you breathe in, you are engaged briefly in fight or flight mode. When you breathe out, you're engaged in digest and repair. And your body, in essence, oscillates between the two. And this is fairly self-explanatory. If you think about it, you have a shock, <gasps> you breathe in automatically. When you're relieved about something, <sighs> you breathe out. Okay? In normal circumstances, when your body's happy, your body should be, in essence, breathing normally. This is where meditation techniques the idea of meditation for full breathing, as is uh, quite often called, is the way you're in essence making sure that the balance between the in-breath and the out-breath is roughly stable. So what you end up getting is you get an oscillation between the two, and then you get a third state, which is called the oxytocin response. Okay? Now, a lot of people who do meditation, they think they need to disengage from the fight or flight and engage with digest and repair. Well, that's not entirely true. It's an interesting starting point, but actually to maintain an oscillation, the body actually needs to be put in between where it's withdrawing both states into this middle state. So what actually really happens with regards to fight or flight? Well, Sapolsky puts it succinctly with his why zebras don't get ulcers. Imagine a zebra on the grassy plain, munching away at, at the grass. Munch, munch, grass, grass. He is in digest and repair mode. Okay, digesting the food, it's quite hard food to digest. I don't know how many stomach zebras have, but he's breaking down the chlorophyll in there, no problem at all. He's chilled out. Along comes a lion. Now instantly the zebra makes this analysis that lion bad, need to run away really quickly. So the body basically shunts adrenaline, adrenaline through the system, gets all the blood flow going on the legs, and off goes the zebra. <laughs> off we go. And it runs away. At the same time this has happened, at the point where adrenaline is released, you also have something called glucocorticoids which are released. Now these only take about sort of between 15 minutes and an hour to get through the system. The adrenaline, on the other hand, happens in maybe a split second. So the adrenaline is there to get you running and get you going. 
At this point, cholesterol is mobilized through the system so it can grab the various sugar to convert into energy to help the zebra run away. And then within about 15 minutes, if the lion has um, not got it within 15 minutes, then hopefully it's escaped because the lion has got exactly the same problem. It's only got about 15 minutes worth of fight in it to actually get him. Okay, so the zebra hopefully has escaped. So it comes back to the grassy plain and goes, Phew, whew, escaped that lion. That was a lucky thing. However, what's happened now is it has burned up an awful lot of energy. Those glucocorticoids are now kicking in and they say to the body, grass is a bit too hard to eat, you know, is because it takes an awful long time to digest to then create back into energy. What if there is another lion coming around the corner? We actually need to get a different type of food stuff so that we can replace the energy as quickly as possible. So it's telling the brain, quite literally, okay, we need high um, access sugars like berries and such like, so therefore the zebra will actually aim for something more easily digestible, the equivalent in human terms would be sort of carbohydrates or cake, yeah, to restore our energy levels quickly. Happy so far? If we're a human being, something different happens because once the, once the zebra has uh, done that, then it goes back to its digestion repair mode and we're fine until the next line comes along. With human beings, unfortunately, we have an issue, is we think too much. So let us say we have a lion chasing us, we run away, we come back and escape. However, rather than cl clicking back into digest and repair mode to get back to what we're doing, we start to go, well, I don't know, what if the lion comes back? I don't know what, what I should be doing. Should I be going back to eating or should there be a lion over there? We, could, we think too much and then we're driving ourselves potty and then we get really, really stressed. Therefore, I'm still putting loads of adrenaline through my system, but I'm not running away, so therefore I'm not using up what's called metabolic demand and I'm really, really panicking because there might be another lion, even though there isn't really another lion. What's going on is I'm really, really panicking and so therefore I'm still in a stress response and so therefore I'm still burning up loads of energy and I still want cake. Okay? We think too much. So what does it look like in terms of from a, for, from a biochemical point of view? The hypothalamus, in essence, releases corticotro corticotropin-releasing hormone, otherwise known as CRH. This then triggers a pituitary gland, which then releases corticotropin, known as ACTH, and then through a series of steps, in essence, triggers the adrenal glands, which output uh, adrenaline, cortisol, and such like, and also the glucocorticoids. Now, as it happens... Uh, Corticotropin-releasing hormone was actually the first brain hormone to be inferred, um, but the last to be isolated. Uh, this dates back, so from 1955, we recognised we had brain hormones, but it wasn't until 1981 we actually managed to isolate it. Now, what it also say is, because my notes have drifted down there, We've also got something called metabolic demand. Now, in the case of the zebra, it is using up all that energy that is, that is getting mobilized by the cholesterol. Okay, so the cholesterol mobilizes the sugars, converts into energy, and it's, u it's burning up the energy by running away from the lion. It's also using up all that adrenaline that's floating through its system. This is why once it's used it up, it gets back and it can switch off easily. In the case of humans, we don't have lions anymore. We have things like mortgages or some boss that really pisses us off or something, yeah? But uh, what we ha what's doing, we're not physically running. And this is where you look at someone who's stressed, is they've got an oscillating leg. Is that quite literally their body is saying, I need to run away, but they're actually sitting down. So what you end up having is you have this reaction where you end up getting an increased cholesterol level, increased blood flow, but actually no movement. And you've got all this adrenaline floating around, so then you end up getting um, usually things like adrenal burnout, like quite literally the person can't sleep and they're also being woken up at three or four o'clock in the morning as well, is because quite literally there's all this adrenaline floating around wanting to get them going. So unless you make use of that stuff that's going around, you'll actually make yourself ill. So if you're making use of the metabolic demand and blood flow, you'll actually be a happy human. However, that doesn't mean to say you go out and do fitness just for the sake of fitness, because you will naturally raise your adrenaline levels. The idea is, supposedly, is you make use of, if you're stressed, at getting stressed, you go punch something, preferably not a human, but, you know, punch bag or something. Make use of the energy that's floating around. Go dig in the garden or something, but just make use of what's hanging around. That makes sense? Yeah? So metabolic demand is actually really key when it comes to humans, is that zebras do, do it automatically. It's already got, it's got to use it. 
Whereas we actually have different threats and yet we're reacting like we are threatened by a lion. It just happens to be called a mortgage and you can't run away from a mortgage. Yes? So what does CRH do? CRH uh, suppresses the appetite. Okay, so you're clicking into fight or flight. This is what happens where the body really does not care about producing stomach acids and the bicarbonates to protect your stomach lining, and it also doesn't care about the digestive processes because it's too bothered about a lion behind it about to eat its bottom, okay? Glucocorticoids, on the other hand, which are released much later, or rather they actually have their effect much later, that increases your appetite, but for a particular type of foodstuff. Now, the glucocorticoids stimulate appetite for preferences for high starch, sugars, and full of fat. That means easy access energy. Now, when I mentioned about food and how your body can react differently to stress, is that if you have a regimented diet, that can be stressful for you. Now, the thing is, if you're stressful, what happens? Your body's outputting glucocorticoids. And if, you're in a, if your body's filled with glucocorticoids, your body's being telling you, I want cake not salad that's in front of me. And also, according to Sapolsky, your body will quite physically deal with the salad that you are eating because you don't like it, compared to if you're actually having fish and chips, which you do. So actually, if, you, if you're happy, your relationship with food is actually also key with whether you actually gain or lose weight and what your body actually does with the food you're eating. Relationship with food is like any other relationship. You treat it nicely, great. If you have an issue with food, then there is a problem. This is where you can look at um, f um, eating disorders, say like bulimia or anorexia, where it's more to do with the psychological approach or relationship with food, which can actually just becomes a vicious circle in many cases. And I'm generalizing hugely with regards to this, but, and it's not necessarily as simple as that. But one of the key things is the biochemical reaction your body has with the food you have. And if you have an issue with it psychologically, it will have a different effect on you physiologically. So, if when the stress is over when you're eating or whatever you're doing, if you've got plenty of glucocorticoids hanging around, you are more likely to eat comfort food because your body's being told, your brain is thinking, I want cake, I really fancy it. And if you follow that, oh, well, my body knows what it wants, that could be a bad way of going down things. Yeah? So now it's time for the strange random post-it game. So who'd like to start? Who wants to pick one? Go on. Yes, Andy. DLPA. What would you like? DLPA. DLPA. OK, now this stands for, those people who are into supplements and such things, stands for DL phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. Yes. <coughs> this is an interesting thing. This is, sort of, this, is, this is sort of random trivia, and it is sort of somehow connected to um, stress and other things. But however, the DLPA is quite interesting, is that... that if you've ever bought supplements, particularly amino acids, and when it comes to um, things like stress, and particularly when it comes to fascia, there are some interesting connections with amino acids. And um, one of the things that uh, Professor Robert Sapolsky talks about is he was saying that when they were testing out fascia to find out the contractile properties, that adrenaline has no bearing on fascia whatsoever. Doesn't happen. These are the, you know, dished out adrenaline, the fascia just simply did not contract and do anything. However, when it was exposed to nitrogen oxide, it actually had a major um, significant contractile effect on the fascia. Now, when it comes to nitrogen oxide, we know that this is really important to vasodilation. It contracts and expands, uh, allows our veins and arteries to uh, expand and contract. And this is reliant on the amino acid arginine. Now, the reason it's called dl phenylalanine is that there are two different types of, amino, um, types of amino acid in there. The L stands for, um, uh, in essence, left. It's reflecting li li light to the left. Okay, and it in more often than not, it means it's the natural form of the amino acid. D, on the other hand, that says it's pointing to the right when passed under a microscope. The light reflects to the right. And this is a synthetic version. Now, even though biochemically or chemically it is absolutely identical, the body knows the difference between the natural form of it and the unnatural form of it, the synthetic version. Now, as it happens, in, in most cases, 
say like L-glutamine, L-carnitine, and all these others, you will see them there. They're all the natural forms because all the benefits that it comes with outweigh the synthetic version of the same thing, as there's normally one or two missing benefits from the synthetic version. In the case of phenlanolene, the synthetic version actually has a couple of benefits as well compared to the natural form, but it's also missing a few. So that by the combination of the synthetic form and the natural form, you get a better um, use of the amino acid. Now this then points to a particular understanding in terms of if the body knows a difference between, even though it's chemically identical, is that just because it reflects light to one side or the other, then it has a totally different action on the body. We can then look at why, where does light play a part with regards to our body's immune system. Now if we think about as it happens, phenylalanine, tryptophan and tyrosine all are the main um, amino acids that actually absorb ultraviolet light in the body. And they also ha actually have a, ma um, a significant part to play when it comes to pain, uh, in the case of phenylalanine, uh, in the case of uh, tryptophan and tyrosine, we're looking at uh, anxiety and depression, or the assistance of, which, may which we may understand why tryptophan, 5-HTP, is quite often used to help people with depression. So there is a part to be played by amino acids, but it would appear that light has a major part to play with regards to the immune system. Now, this is not entirely unknown. Think about it. There's several people, you know, when the sun's out, we feel decidedly better than we do when it's raining. There are certain types of people who suffer from, say, ME and chronic fatigue who can, to a certain degree, in some cases, be completely cured just by going to some sunny climes for a bit. Now, what is also interesting is vitamin D, we're continually told that vitamin D is a deficiency at the moment, and would this be anything to do with this complete obsession with us reducing our cholesterol levels? Because vitamin D does not come from sunlight. Sunlight is converted by cholesterol sulfate in the body into vitamin D. If you don't have enough cholesterol in your body, then you don't get it converted into vitamin D, and so therefore you'd have vitamin D deficiency. And there is a part to be played with vitamin D in relationship to the, those three amino acids in terms of how you feel. And we've already mentioned that how you feel is also part to how those interstitial mechanoreceptors react. There are connections here and it's worth investigating. In fact, in one of the other, um, one of the other seminars we do on just on amino acids, we actually look at that and we go in a bit further with that. But then we can look at some of the interesting stuff done with penicillin in the early 1930s, is that while it was still in its natural form, there was no such thing as being allergic to penicillin. Post the Second World War, where there was such a demand for penicillin, it was then synthesized, because apparently normal penicillin naturally sort of brewed, if you like, takes several weeks to do. In the case of synthesization, you can do it you know, in a matter of days. What happened then was, in essence, what you have is that you, four years post the introduction of synthetic penicillin, you suddenly find there is an explosion of people who are allergic to penicillin. Now, interestingly, the Egyptians, they talked about um, the differences between li life, um, living um, herbs and medicinal um, uh, plants and ones that are dead. They had a different action and you'd use them differently. If it was for internal, you'd use living plants, and if it was for external, they'd use dead ones. And it was noted there was a, a, a distinct difference. In fact, even in cooking, if you use fresh herbs versus dried herbs, dried herbs quite often are stronger, but they're obviously not living, whereas fresh herbs somehow do taste different. It's this idea where, the, where we talked about the five elements, that, that life force that's within it, does make a difference in terms of how your body deals with it. And is it the same thing? Is it the difference that the body does actually recognize something that is natural versus something that is synthetic? even though chemically it's identical. So DLPA, that's the connection there. A little bit random, but does that make sense? Yes. Next. Take a pick. Uh, cholesterol. cholesterol. So cholesterol, friend or foe? My question this is that your brain is 65% water, roughly. Of the rest, it's all saturated fat and cholesterol. Every synapse in your brain is coated with cholesterol. Whenever you breathe, the lubricants that allow you to breathe are saturated fat, not unsaturated fat. 
we already dis uh, we've already talked about that when you're stressed, when you're going to stress, your body mobilizes cholesterol to grasp the sugar so that it can convert to energy. Cholesterol is completely uh, needed when it com in terms of converting um, sunlight into vitamin D. It is part of our repair mechanism. There's a rather um, fascinating um, uh, piece of research, and there's a picture of it that I, I've yet to get copyright for. And it's, uh, the story goes that there was this guy, and he had a, uh, a thinning artery wall. I think it was the aorta, if I remember rightly. I can't, but it was so thin that the uh, doctor said, you seriously need an operation because it could basically collapse at any moment. You, that's it for you. Um, and for whatever reason, I can't remember whether it was a religious reason or just because the guy was bloody-minded, I have no idea. But he said, no, uh, you know, you can uh, monitor me all you like, but I'm not having any kind of medication, um, and I'm not having an operation. If this is my time to go, that's it. Over time, what they do is they're monitoring him, and his cholesterol levels were going through the roof. You know, they're saying you ba should be basically a solid. And what was going on in this particular time is that uh, cholesterol, we have to remember, is a bit like a repairman on uh, the potholes is that as you get little, if your acidity levels in your arteries get too high, you get little pittings that down the arteries, and your cholesterol, quite literally, it fills in the holes. It makes it, it, it in essence, is a repair process. Now, what happened in this particular guy is that the cholesterol levels are going sky high, but after a particular time, they started to drop, but then his calcium, his blood calcium levels started to go up. Eventually, when they took an x-ray, because the guy died of something else some time later, there's this fantastic x-ray picture of a tube of bone formed around the area that had thinned. And what the, uh, the medics, uh, this is sort of maybe like 10 or 15 years ago, this changed the way in which they viewed cholesterol as what was actually going on is the body presumably was raising cholesterol level to try and repair that thinning area. But presumably it was so thin that cholesterol repair job wasn't going to do the job, so therefore the body does what it does best, which is okay, in which case then we'll um, come in with the old osteo blast, is it, I can't remember which way around it is, osteoblast, to then create uh, some bone to actually fix the hole, and it achieved it. Amazing is that if given when the body's operating correctly, the body knows what it's doing. So just having a high cholesterol level, if there is any such thing, I have to say, um, maybe it's just doing its job. Maybe if you're stressed, the reason you're stressed is maybe because you're, you're that's why your cholesterol levels may be high. Now, cholesterol is meant to be there. Your diet affects less than 20% of your cholesterol level anyway. And if there was any link to do with cholesterol, in fact, saturated fat, actually, I would, well, let's just look at this for a minute. If you take the Eskimos over in, um, as the Yupik Indians, I think the research was done, Yupik Indians, basically Eskimos, over in Alaska, they have the highest saturated fat consumption in the world. They don't have their five a day. They don't eat fruit or vegetables. They have whale meat and seal meat. And some people would say, oh, yes, but they do eat fish. It's that omega-3, isn't it? Well, they don't really eat that much fish, but OK. Leave them for a moment. They're in extreme conditions, but, and they ha basically only eat saturated fat. You go over to the, Ken the Maasai's. Now, the Kenyans, they have the highest cholesterol consumption in the world. They eat basically blood, milk, goat meat. Uh, they only eat fruit in season. They don't really have that many vegetables. Now, in terms of the way where in which they live, the extremities of te temperature are completely different between those two cultures. Their feeding patterns are completely different. And in terms of the, um, their format, if you think about it, the Kenyans are usually quite thin and the Eskimos are usually quite fat. However, the common denominator between these two cultures is they never get heart disease. Now, people say, oh, what about that research by Ansel Keys in the 1950s, which is pretty much the key piece of research that we always quote when it comes to saturated, saturated fat and cholesterol. The problem with that piece of research is that he sees no difference in that piece of research between natural saturated fats, as in lard and butter, and synthetic natural, uh, saturated fats such as margarine and shortenings. If he did, the piece of research looks rather different. Is that, yes, synthetic natural fats probably do have a, a, a connection with heart disease, and there is more likely to be a connection with something called LPA, 
uh, which is a, a lipoprotein A, I think it stands for, as a marker for heart disease, and it has very little relevance regardless of what your cholesterol and your saturated fat levels are. And in fact, there's, uh, the, of the people that do die of um, uh, heart disease, it's about a 50-50 split between the people who have high cholesterol and high blood pressure and those people who have low cholesterol and high, uh, low blood pressure. So again, is there really a connection between cholesterol, saturated fat and heart disease? The answer is not that I can find and actually you try and find me a piece of research that actually says so. The Framingham study, which is one of the largest um, studies that's been going on for something like 60 years now in, the stu in a city called Framingham in the USA, and they basically they monitor the whole town is that every year, since they've, since they've been doing the study, they say the same thing over and over <laughs> again. They can find no evidence that the diet, uh, whether it be high in saturated fats and cholesterol or low, has any bearing on heart disease. And if we wanted any more evidence than that, then there was a, 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 the, the, it's the only countrywide um, study of its kind, and it was the country of Japan, is that in, I think it was the late 1970s, it was noticed that the stroke rate in Japan was r something like 400 times that of any other Western nation. It was ridiculous, and yet their heart disease rate was fine, uh, and their life expectancy was fine, but their stroke rate seemed to be off the chart. And after a serious studies, they looked at the, the, the traditional Japanese diet had very little cholesterol in it, so, as a, as a governmental decision, they decided to introduce cholesterol into the Japanese diet, which is now why we have so many broths in Japanese-type um, um, uh, cooking now, is that it was increasing the cholesterol level, and strangely what happened is within a less than a decade, the stroke rate plummeted to normal levels. And there's actually more and more evidence to suggest that actually a higher cholesterol level is actually in a gift of lower stroke rates. So cholesterol, friend or foe, I would argue it's there for us. Yes, you can. There may be a marker for other things in connection with something else and something else and stress and something else. But on its own, there really is no evidence to suggest so. Not that I can find anyway. Any questions on that one? Go on. Yes. Yes, contradictory, yes. And, and the ethnicity. Ethnicity. And then the race. I don't know yes. if it's also other environmental factors influencing it. Yes, there's bound to be. If you think about the types of, uh, the, from my point of view, I would say it's in the Western world, again, this is my opinion, in the Western world, from my point of view, it's, n it's more to do with the fact that we do not eat na a natural diet. As far as I personally, I would ban aspartum and I would stop eating margarine instantly and just get on with cracking on and eating butter and lard like we used to in the 1920s. And in fact, there is a direct correlation between the first case of heart disease in the 19, 1912, I think it was, in America. And we know that previously it really didn't exist because we know from, again, DNA testing and all this other stuff that heart disease just didn't really exist. Yet by 1953, it was the biggest killer in the United States. The only change in diet over there was, this, was the introduction of trans fats and shortenings in 1922 and the wholesale bitching about how bad saturated fat was for you and so the, the consumption of lard and fat was reduced significantly while people were consuming margarine and all this stuff about how healthy we should be eating and yet people were actually getting less healthy and more obese, not the other way around. Now in regards to ethnicity, you could argue, it's like, well think about it, if you have an Eskimo in very cold climes, of course you need plenty of fat, just as an insulator, it's the way the body adapts and it's still a natural diet. It might not be our five a day, but if that's your available f um, food source, your body is very clever, it'll adapt to anything. Fat and proteins, all carbohydrates, the body can break down any of them. It might be easier to break down carbohydrates, but fundamentally, Nutritionally wise, proteins and fats are actually far better for our bodies. And yet in that extremity, the, 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 the average meal probably calorifically is actually um, relatively small compared to what we consume, and yet their body has got more demand for calories based on how blinking cold it is. 
And in case of uh, the Kenyans, what you have is you, you, you can bet your life they don't consume thousands and thousands of calories every day. It's more like probably several thousand calories in a week. So it's probably the quantities of food and the quantities of natural food that are consuming based on that, rather than necessarily it's to do with either cholesterol or saturated fat, because the body can break down any of it. And as we've already said, there's only really a 20% um, effect on the body, supposedly, of what your diet is like in terms of your cholesterol levels are only affected. 80% of it is regulated by the liver. So you are correct. Is the ethnicity, uh, what is it? Is it actually to do with cholesterol saturated fat or is it actually more to do with the type of rubbish we eat, in, certainly in the Western world, and the quantities of food we eat? Because we're like metabolic demand. If we're eating X number of calories but we're not actually burning it off, what's the body supposed to do with it? And what is also interesting with regards to fat is that the body protects itself from poisons by creating lots of fat. So therefore, if you're eating junk, is it necessary that junk is filled with stuff that is going to put on pounds, or is it the body is actually trying to protect you and saying, this is poison, I need to actually draw it away from ourselves. This is ostensibly one of the reasons why um, people who are very large have got a, less, a lesser chance of being poisoned, because quite literally they've got plenty of fat to withdraw away the toxins from the organs. This is why you have fat around the heart, the liver, the kidneys, all the major organs, the body protects itself. And if you're being poisoned on a constant basis, or maybe you've got a long-term illness, you'll find that the fat levels start to build up to draw away the toxins from the body. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Any other questions on with regard to that? Did I explain myself reasonably well with that? Yeah. Yes, because of the way you absorb light. So you yeah. the whole yes. Process, right? Yes, because the chances are, and again, you'd find that uh, natural way of living would be you wouldn't be doing sunbathing in the middle of the day like us Western Western idiots do. The chances are you'd be up at probably the crack of dawn, and then you'd be in before the sun actually hits its zenith, and you'd probably sit in the shade for several hours. Uh, now, the, the way the body is also dealing with it is while the body is not being burnt or the skin is not being burnt, the cholesterol is able to function correctly. If you start, once it starts to burn, then the skin doesn't function correctly and therefore you're not going to be converting to vitamin D very well, and off we go. Um, again, there's an awful lot to be said for traditional, um, a traditional way of living, wi wi regardless of where you come from, versus what is at the present a type of insanity that the Western world has a tendency to do. I'm generalising hugely, but let's face it, we, we just take a look at America. Nobody said this way, <laughs> I'm getting pointed to this way. That makes sense, yes? Anything else on that? Okay. As you asked the question, Joe? Sorry? As you asked the question, what would you like next? Uh, moody cells. Moody cells. Yes. I th this is a, an interesting thing, is that it was always presumed that particular cells um, had a particular function and were only receptive pa to particular types of hormones. So therefore, you know, liver cell only had the uh, response to liver hormone, you know, whatever it may be. What is the hormone that stimulates liver? I can't remember offhand. Um, now, it was found recent, relatively recently, I think in the last uh, two or three years, is that it was found that all cells actually have receptors for every hormone in the body, but one of them is particularly predominant, which then is then leading to, in terms of the stem cell research and what do we do with cells, why does a cell just simply copy what it's doing? There is a possibility, is that if you have a the, the possibility of receptivity, you can retrain a cell to be something else. Now this applies to human beings, if you think about it, we might be an accountant or a therapist, and yes, it would take some doing to maybe change your career, and it might be tricky, but you have the possibility to do lots of things, and actually human beings are a good reflection of the cell anyway. And so if we have receptors, if we have the p potential of uh, receptivity of any hormone, now hormones have an awful lot to do with our moods. So the postulation, the, the, the piece of research done, I'm trying to remember where it was, it might have been the Lancet again, actually, is that they were saying that, well, if we can actually get the brain to start to output particular types of hormone, but in a, in a singular way, could we then affect the cells as a whole to make us feel happy 
is that the, the, at the moment they're looking at it in terms of depression, is that if, if how our cell feels, quite literally, is then a reflection of how we feel as a whole, then there is a possibility of dealing with particular types of uh, mood type disorders, say like depression, by stimulating particular types of hormones across the board and seeing what happens to the cell. How far ahead that is, I have no idea, but in terms of it shows there's potential, and it also makes enough sense, why wouldn't a cell, the cell, cell starts off as being pure, and then it says, okay, you, liver, you, kidney, and then they pretty much stay there. But the idea is, can it be reprogrammed? Can it be taken back a step to say, okay, you go over there, now you can be a kidney cell? Don't know. I just thought it was a little bit interesting, that one, but... Somebody over here. Silence. Come on, you've got to pick, pick one of five. What's love got to do with it? Oh, yes, now. As I've already mentioned, light. Now, in terms of... It is possibly one of the worst cases of um, animal experimentation that has been about, really. It's a chap, by a chap called Harlow in the 1950s, and he did a whole series of experiments done on monkeys. And the reason he started off with this is, is that there was a... Uh, the, the Freudians were looking at um, how the body deals with um, babies and whether love really exists per se. Is it just a biochemical reaction? Is that the baby only goes for the mother's milk because that's, or goes for the mother is because that's where the food's coming from. And so therefore it's just simply love is just a biochemical reaction in the same way that adults, the woman only really stays with the man or vice versa because whoever's the breadwinner, you've got a roof over your head, etc., etc. So it's just simply a case of survival or biochemistry. Does love per se actually really exist? So this chap Harlow decided he was going to prove them wrong and do some experiments. And what he did is he was, he was um, lopping off heads of mother monkeys and sticking them on sticks and lots of other really drastic things. Um, and he was taking away uh, baby monkeys from the mothers, sticking them in the room, and on one area there was the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the head with a piece of terry toweling, on the other was the uh, was a head with um, uh, a basically the milk. And in every case, the baby monkey always went for the comfort rather than the nutrition to the point where it would actually die, even though it knew where the milk was. So he sort of disproved, in essence, that uh, babies do not go for their mother just for the milk. It is actually for comfort. Uh, and this will, this will come back to the oxytocin response that we'll be talking about um, uh, a little bit later. This, this sort of this middle ground, the nearest thing that uh, animals have to the love response, if you like. It's neither fight or flight, and it's not digest and repair. In fact, both parts calm down, and you end up having this area which is akin to comfort or love. Um, now, part of this, this experiment that Harlow did is that he also found that wh when you put the... when you withdrew the baby from the mother and went through this particular traumatic event and then returned it back to a mother, um, later on in life, the basically roughly the adolescent period, the babies would act up. They would get. A, they would, in essence, have um, things akin to depression and um, basically emotional um, troublings. And it only and it happened to those ones that had been withdrawn from the mother early. So again, this is also pointing out the importance of connection with the money mother at an early age. And separation from the mother does create long-lasting emotional problems, as a, a sort of an ingrained level. So this idea that babies don't remember anything is, is, is sort of a bit insane. So again, we come back to the emotional response connected to psychology and physiologically. Yeah. Any questions on that? Next. Over there, down at the back. Is it fat enough? Now, we've already mentioned about this, the, what the glucocorticoids do. Uh, and leptin. I mentioned it earlier, is one of the uh, latest hormones to be found. And this is where we understand that fat is part of the endocrine system, is that when, the, uh, when that zebra has eaten all its berries and its energy levels are restored, those fat cells say, OK, I'm fat enough, thanks, and it releases the hormone called leptin. And that tells the brain, OK, switch back into normal 
eating mode where we go back to eating grass. However, leptin is ignored if you are still in the stress state. So normally speaking, our body should say, yes, I'm fat enough, I've got enough energy, thank you very much. Leptin is released, great. However, if we're still worrying about our mortgage, we're still stressed, therefore those glucocorticoids and the um, corticotropin is being released, in which case then the brain says, I don't care what you say, we're obviously going to be running away from a lying in a second, so just shut up, so therefore you still end up comfort eating. Okay. Can I just ask a question? Um, you said earlier that adrenaline doesn't have an effect on fascia. No. Does oxytocin have an effect? That's a good question, and the answer is I don't know offhand. I would imagine it would do in terms of it's affecting the body as a whole, as it's closing down both the digestive, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems to a point. Now, the... Um, this is actually, you can have tend and befriend because this is actually exactly to do with the oxytocin response. This middle ground is being called the tend and befriend response, oxytocin response, depending on which you like. Um, and it was noted uh, by a lady called Shelley Taylor that all the experiments done on the fight or flight mechanism um, were uh, done on male lions because it was done by male um, uh, lab guys. And... <laughs> According to Sapolsky, what happened is she, she says, well, hang on a minute. Do the ladies get a say here? So she started to do some investigation in terms of the fight or flight response with regards to lionesses, and it turns out there is actually a third, this third oxytocin response. Um, it would appear that um, uh, women tend to have more of this oxytocin release than men do, but men do have it, and it's sort of this... this protective behaviour, it's this middle ground is that yes, lionesses can fight and yes, lionesses can run away. However, if there's a young, uh, if there's young involved, then there'll be this middle ground of trying to befriend the male lion. And this is called tend and befriend, is to try and convince at various different ways, some of them involving pheromones, some of them sort of chumming up with the lion to try and convince the lion that actually this little kid is his and doesn't need killing because apparently any new male lion that enters into the pack will try and kill all the young and apparently lionesses can get pretty uh, nifty at um, persuading these male uh, these male lions that actually these cubs are actually his and so therefore there is this calming response where the body actually doesn't panic it doesn't run away and it doesn't fight it goes into this sort of almost like um diplomatic okay calm down guys type of way and if, if you think about it even ever about in a pub on a Friday night or something, you've got the lad scrapping, one of the girls is bound to go in there and say, stop it now, calm down. Yeah? Um, it is this, this middle ground where it would appear that the digestive responses and the um, immune response start to uh, reduce, as does the um, heart rate and blood pressure reduces, doesn't increase, but oxytocin is released where it would appear it's a calming effect on the system. Again, it's still in its infancy, really, in terms of our understanding, but there's some really interesting stuff to do with the, what's called the reticular formation, which is sort of our gatekeeper of the brain, which makes a decision of what to do in these circumstances. The, and again, the body's all about survival. So this may also explain in the area of, say, certain types of rape cases where uh, the woman has actually just calmed down and let it happen. And the argument about this is, okay, is it possibly this oxytocin response, whereas the brain has made a decision, okay, what is my best chance of survival here? Is it to A, run away, B, to fight, or actually just to let it happen and get it over with? Again, it's, it's another one of these things the body has is all about survival. What is your best option here? And so therefore, it is, again, it's an interesting concept, and again, it's worth looking into. But again, it just shows you again where, you know, Shelley Taylor, because she, she was a woman, she was looking at it in a different way, and it turns out that all these experiments have been done on guys, not girls. Yes? Um, I don't know, it's a massage in schools programme. Yeah. They um, have done quite a lot of research into children at schools with oxytocin levels, and they okay. are bringing massage into schools to help um, behaviour problems. Okay, that would make sense. After the kids have gone out to play, they come in and they, they do this really, really basic massage yeah. on each other, because yeah. they believe at home, with life as it is, and parents, mm. no tactile touch, yes. and homes, etc. Mm. Um, and it's really worked. Um, well, you've mentioned the, the, the thing you've just mentioned there, which I think is key there, is a the tactile touch. Mm. 
is that when we're looking at fascia again, I'm trying to sort of bring it back into fascia at some point each time, is that if um, fascia is our emotional connection with the world at a various level, we have to remember fascia, all fascia is connective tissue. It runs through our entire body. Now, if it is our emotional level and we're not getting any feedback, the body's always about feedback. And what is interesting about the mechanoreceptors, and this applies across the, across the board, if I remember rightly, is that people who have, say, uh, long-term uh, lower back pain, um, what they're finding out is there's actually less mechanoreceptors, and yet the body, in essence, gets paranoid, is that it doesn't have enough information, so therefore it goes, oh, there's a problem, and then starts to, to create more pain. Because I remember the pain is not, is n I don't want to say not real, it's very real, but it's all translated by the brain, is that we have to look at these things in terms of if the body doesn't have enough feedback, it sort of presu presumes the worst. And it's also not necessarily about the information coming this way. It's basically about, um, I think, uh, Professor Lorimer Mosley. He's another chap to look at, actually. So I'll get to you in a minute, Joe. Um, okay, what, Lorimer Mosley? No, 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 <laughs> just the, the you're saying the Meccano receptor. I think that's some research done that showed that three nerve endings could shift from being yeah. essentially proprioceptive to um, sort of nociceptive, so they well, this is a something else that Slife actually disagrees with. He says that this whole idea of free nerve endings just being about nociception or proprioception is incorrect, is that it's something like less than 20% of them actually deal with nociception as in pain, and actually the rest of it is to do with movement, um, hot, cold, lots of other information. The, the actual pain bit is actually quite small. Most of pain, according to Lorimer Mosley, is about perception of what's going on and how dangerous is it to you. And he quote he does has, has a good little story about this. He's, he says um, he says he was w when he first got into this. Uh, this chap, uh, Dr. Lauren Mosley, uh, he's a don at uh, was don at Cambridge, and he's over. He's an Australian guy. Again, very entertaining speaker. If you ever get a, um, a lecture by this guy, go and see him. He is the man about pain in the same way as Sapolsky is about uh, stress. And he talks about um, he was down in the Billabong in Australia, as you do, camping, uh, and he got got up in the morning and. He was walking about, his toe stubbed a, a little pebble, um, and his brain didn't react. It wasn't worth mentioning. Obviously, there's, you know, there's a triggering of those mechanoreceptors, so therefore it's triggering pain. Oh, dear. You know, but it's not, nothing to worry about, because there's lots of pebbles on a billabong. It's not threatening, so therefore he got on with it. He was like, oh, OK. Next thing you know, he's three months later, he's woken up in, in hospital, because actually it turns out it wasn't a pebble that he hit, what it was, it was, I think it was either um, one of these deadly funnel web spiders or some kind of snake, and it bit him. Okay, so many moons later, he's back at the billabong, because it's Australia, it's threatening all the time anyway, so what do I care, I'm going to go into the same billabong, go camping again, and he gets up in the morning and does, in essence, exactly the same thing. He wakes up in the morning and his, his toes stumbles on a little pebble. This time, however, his brain goes ballistic, He's suddenly hopping around going, oh my god, I've injured myself! And he had to stop because he just says, hang on a minute, I've just tapped a pebble, and it was a pebble this time, but the last time he did this, his brain didn't react, and it basically nearly killed him. This time, however, it's ramped up the volume. Is next time that toe hits that thing, because the last, last time we did this, it was threatening, so this time we're going to treat it as threatening, so therefore the levels of pain went up. His perception of what was going on was completely through the roof. It was overdoing it. And so understanding about pain is much to do with perception and how threatening it is. And this is where the reticular formation comes in, is this, this gatekeeper. It makes a decision of, A, how threatening is it to me? How much information is coming this way? If you don't have feedback, either through touch or whatever it may be, then the argument is that actually you don't have enough development within that area. You get presumably less and less mechanoreceptors, so therefore you get less information, and then the body has to make its own mind up. I was uh, listening to a, bit of a little story kind of related about, yeah. uh, it's all to do with mirror box therapy and stuff. With yeah. Um, yeah. Amputee yeah. saying that because if you're familiar with mirror neurons, yeah. like if we see someone being, yeah, if we see someone being hit with a hammer, yes. there's a neuron okay. in our brain yeah. that fires to feel that pain. Yes. And they said that with amputees, normally we'll suppress it with, with our hands, saying actually that's no, fine. Um, but with amputees, they found that actually when their hand was hit, or when they watched the hand being hit, they would feel the pain. Yes. And then they used the therapy to remove yeah. that sort of stimulus. Yes, I mean, we all remember the James Bond torture scene. 
every guy. Th th this is this is true, uh, and th there is something to be said in terms of how the wh how how the body how the the particular limb has been amputated amputated at a time. If it was in trauma itself, then quite literally those muscles or the fascia is con contracted, and then there's no chance to relax it because it's still in a state of contraction. So by using mirror therapy, if it can watch the other hand relax then it's telling the brain, ah, oh, I'm relaxing that. And it's, again, you might call it placebo, but ultimately, does the patient feel better, yes or no? Well, then great. If it's to do with phantom pain, so, well, it's not really phantom, it's actually genuine pain. But if we can do that, it's great. But yes, it's, um, yeah, I don't fancy using a hammer, but yeah. James Bond will do. Uh, tender friend, yes. Does that answer your question with regards to the massage? Yeah? What I would say is, as, as another example, and I can talk from personal experience, and it was a, a bit of a aha moment, uh, I walked 500 miles across uh, Spain <coughs> last year on the Way of St. James, if you've ever heard of that. And um, what was fascinating about this is that you're in pain every day. Okay, you're walking 20 miles every day, non-stop. Well, I mean, yes, you take breaks, but it's every day you're doing this, walking 500 miles. For some reason, voluntarily, you get up every morning to do it all over again, even though you're in pain and you're not enjoying yourself, but it's actually great because it's not threatening and your body is in pain. And there was a particular day when we were climbing a mountain and I couldn't walk any further because the amount of pain my legs were in, I quite literally was in tears. It was just I couldn't take a, a, a one step forward. However, walking backwards was fine, so I walked down a mountain backwards. The following day, when we did the next 20 miles, not only my body repaired itself, it was fine to do another 20 miles. But that day, my, pain, my, my brain was whinging. You know, it's like, ow, I'm hurting, ow. Moan, whinge, my legs were hurting, my shoulders were hurting. I was just in so much pain. And then I took a step, and we did, this is the only day we ever did 21 miles. I took a step and something went ping in my uh, left Achilles. Interestingly, all my pain went away really quickly. It vanished because it suddenly went, Whoo! this sounds like something rather serious has happened. <laughs> and, it was, and I was just like, I can't believe it to you lying bastards. You've just been telling me I'm in pain and actually you've gone because you're actually more worried about something that's actually quite serious. And you think about uh, kids, you know, kids will whinge and moan, but the ones you've actually got to really worry about are the ones when, they, when they're really quiet. You know, something serious happens that they're distracted. And the, bra the body did exactly the same thing. It's quite fascinating to, to, to feel that, that I was suddenly in zero pain because I was then suddenly really concerned about my ankle. As it happens, it was a minor sprain, but actually all my pain vanished instantly. It was quite fascinating. So again, just shows you how much, pain, it, how much of pain is actually real pain and how much of it is in here. Uh, oh, so I was just wondering if... It's like you get that with, with ultra, ultra runners who talk about um, running through pain barriers and everything. Every yeah. Every bit of muscle is hurting and then, they, and then suddenly they don't notice it anymore. Because mm, the brain's hopped into a different space. Yeah. I wonder if it's something your endocrine system kicking in and doing a separate job. Mm. Um, well, certainly when it comes to, uh, we'll sort of revisit this with regards to fascial running versus muscular running. And this may also, uh, again, ethnicity has got something to do with this. You know, the, the best long distance runners tend to be the Ethiopians and from sort of the northern African countries. It's traditionally they do an awful lot of it, but they run in a relaxed way. And they can run endlessly. And the same with, um, you know, um, the women walking across with, you know, vast weights on their head. Uh, and, but because they're walking fascially, there's this spring in this, the spring in the step. They're, they're used in a natural loading structure of the body to spring them along the way, whereas Westerners, we tend to walk. I must walk, so I'm using my muscles to walk. I'm not springing in any way, and therefore I crush my spine and end up having you know, um, herniated discs and such like, because I'm always stressed and I must be walking because I'm using my muscles to do it, rather than allowing my body to naturally drive me forward. So you've got to think Tigger rather than Eeyore, presumably. I've also got another theory. Was like you, you look at videos of people in the 1970s and how they used to move and walk. They used to walk in a really sort of natural sort of springy way. Yeah. Whereas subsequently, I don't know if, um, I don't know if it's because people started going to the gym a lot more since then. Uh, I ban way. gyms personally. Is that kind of, you know, that old subject, is that kind of yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, th again, it's, uh, what, are the, what are the influences? What are the cultural influences of the time? You probably find in the 70s there was, there was an awful lot of uh, looking at, in the, certainly the Caribbean culture and African culture, it was, you know, thinking about, I'm generalizing hugely, but you know, Bob Marley, that kind of stuff, it was all very chilled out kind of thing, and everybody was g I'm free and easy. It sounds, I'm generalizing hugely here, but the cultural perception of that is that you then see the movies. Now, again, movies are not necessarily real life, but you will find that people are acting in that kind of way. They're copying it, so therefore, you will see it. If people are walking up this, you know, round about now, and yet, normally speaking, they're sort of chilled out. I think Yeah, well, yes, of course it is. It's, it's, it's whatever the culture is there. It's, it's what you see, what you feel. It's, it's bound to have an effect. Your environment will affect how you function physically, psychologically, and emotionally. You can't get around it. Well, the interesting, what the, 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 the fascia is a triple helix, is that, and one of those strands is water. Uh, you know, it's, it's a key ingredient to fascia, and there is much to be said to do with hydration uh, with regards to the fascia. Now, what's interesting is that if you're not if you have too much water then the fascia actually becomes tighter not more loose again it's this balance between one and the other is that yes you can go on about hydration if you like and i'm sure you know much as people will say oh well coffee's got water in it it's the same as water and there are uh, certain toxicologists i would that would argue that actually it shouldn't really make any difference um, the conversations get heated i would argue that water is water is water and ca caffeine is a stimulant a stimulant ramps up the, the, a stimulant that also ramps up your heart rate, stimulates the digestive processes, and so at the very least, even if you've got the same hydrating quality, you're going to be burning up more energy. So therefore, it can't the hydrated quality would be negated, wouldn't it? Now, I'm just you know I'm just flabbergasted that the um, I think it was uh, Byron wrote a whole load of treatises about coffee and those browned juices because it was a banned substance. It was in the same um, uh, degree of uh, illegality as heroin is now. It was a grade A drug, caffeine and its stimulating effects on the system. Now I'm sure the refined prices of um, coffee these days might be different, but you know, I gave up coffee for a few years and somebody gave me some instant caffeinated coffee once without telling me and I was bouncing off the walls. And anybody tell you that it didn't have a significant effect on my body, you can go, you know, <laughs> it's like dust. And what were you going to say else about the caffeine stuff? Because it's quite an interesting thing we've got to that. I just going to say that, you know, since the 70s, uh, that's another big, big change. So going to the gym, which I think tightens fascia quite a lot, and then altering the fluidity of fascia with things like coffee. And Great coffee is directly going to act on the, the same hormonal response that you're talking about. It has to. If it has the same effect, if it has a similar, a, a mimicking effect at the same, at the, at the very least, to fight or flight. In other words, if it's raising your heart rate, which naturally increases your blood pressure, then in essence your body is being almost forced into a um, a fight or flight response. Maybe not without, maybe without the adrenaline response and the glucocorticoid response, but it's going to be affecting your system. And any chemical interference has an effect on your body. You know, it's the old myths of, you know, cheese makes you dream or chocolate gives you migraines. For some people, this is, from their point of view, that's absolutely true. Um, all food is technically a toxin. Your body is just how your body deals with it. Doesn't mean to say it's nat naturally dangerous to you, but at some point the body may just develop an intolerance to said thing. And the, the, it's bound to happen with coffee and considering how much we consume about it. The only thing I would say, as like with anything else, when the body's exposed to something for a long period of time, it starts to zone it out. The same with uh, painkillers. Long-term use of painkillers is well, well noted. That it almost has a reverse effect because you're telling the body there is no pain and the brain is saying, uh, yes, there is. So it turns up the volume. So long-term use of pain, you end up getting chronic pain sufferers that are on a truckload of painkillers. They're chronically constipated, which of course is raising your toxic levels anyway, which means you're going to get more pain response from those interstitial uh, mechanoreceptors. So long-term use of painkillers, it's, it's insanity, and they're still in just as much pain. And yet you then withdraw from those painkillers and suddenly they're, on, they're clearer headed, their body's functioning better, they're still in pain, mind you, but somehow it's more capable with because th there's a clarity of thinking. Again, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. When you're in that sort of level of pain, it's, it's, a, it's a hard <laughs> ass to sort of say, oh yes, we won't give you any. Short-term wise, certainly might, may well be useful because you're relaxing the muscle tissue, which then stops squeezing the nerve endings, so therefore you're in less pain. But
that sort of had sort of disappeared off on a tangent on that one. Anything else on that particular subject? No? Okay. Last two. The foreign one, Usain and Kasparov. Now this is an interesting one in terms of what we think about physical exercise. Is that um, the there was some experiments done by the Russians. Um, I, again, I think it was in sort of like sixties or seventies. No, it must have been later than that because it involves Kasparov. Uh, when was Kasparov? Was he seventies? Wasn't he? I think famous chess master. And what they were looking at is that okay, what is going on with someone who is ostensibly sitting down doing nothing for a living? but at a sort of an Olympic level, <coughs> using his brain, versus someone, say, like Usain Bolt, who is going to be running, you know, 100 metres, and his heart rate is going to be fired up. There's going to be loads of movement. There's, you know, muscles are powering away, adrenaline and everything else. It would appear that actually heart rate and energy absorption, calorific um, consumption, heart rate, blood pressure, is actually almost the same for a chess master as it is for an Olympic athlete, even though the chess master is sat down, not running away, not doing anything physically, but actually the brain, because it uses up to about 65% of our energy anyway in terms of thinking, because he's thinking so hard, he's actually burning up that, meta he's using, making use of that metabolic demand we talked about earlier, is that actually between an Olympic athlete and a chess master, Phys the physical strains on the body in terms of heart rate and everything else is actually about the same. Uh, it's worth thinking about that. So that doesn't mean to say you can sit down and do nothing and watch telly, uh, not expect to put on a pound. But in his case, he is using his brain at full tilt, and it is muscle like any others, and he's using up, he's using up that energy like there's no tomorrow, and his heart rate is high, and his blood pressure is high to be able to do that. Fascinating thing. Any questions on that one? Okay, so, last one, stress and ulcers. Uh, this is an interesting one. I, I still hear this from doctors even now, which is quite staggering considering that this happened now, heading on for almost 20 years ago. This strange thing about, you know, the body does not, except in very exceptional circumstances, it's either engaged in fight or flight or digestion repair. It doesn't do both. When you're in fight or flight, it shuts down the digestion process. Peristalsis, in essence, slows down. A whole bunch of things happen where the body is not making use of the digestive process, not producing stomach acids, not producing bicarbonates, when it's bothered about a lion chasing it. And yet, continually used to hear about, oh, it's my ulcer, it's the stress. And I've got high stomach acids. And you still hear this. And actually, there was some piece of research, I think, this February that pointed out this very thing that something like 90% of people that prescribed sort of Rennies and um, antacids for high stomach acids actually is the reverse is true. Is actually the, the problem is they've actually got low stomach acids, not the other way around, but their feeling of reflux. So what you have is, that, OK, well, why are people getting stomach ulcers then? And it would appear, I think it was in the late 90s, that a couple of medical students sort of asked, had the gall to question their professor and say, well, hang on a minute, you've just told us, you know, basic biology is fight or flight or digest and repair. You can't have both. How can you possibly have high stomach acids when you're stressed? And they were told to shut up. So they went away and did some investigations. Um, and they kept on at it. And they said, well, it doesn't make any sense. But you keep hearing it. Oh, yes, stomach ulcer, stress, off we go. Turns out it was a bacteria called Helibacter pylori, but it still took them a decade to convince anybody that they were talking the truth. What's fascinating is that it would appear that ulcers can actually be formed in less than 48 hours, not the many months that it was presumed so, which then goes to explain why do people have an awful lot of reflux and or, or acid types feeling when they suddenly go on holiday? Because a lot of people, you know, their body ends up getting ill. And the argument was that what appears to be the case is that when you're stressed, you, don't, you just don't produce enough stomach acids and you don't produce any bicarbonates to protect your stomach lining. Now, the Helibacter pylori bacteria that exists in there, and apparently they sort of belong in there, really, and they're kept roughly at bay as things go. However, when you're stressed, they basically have a party because there isn't any acids to keep them at bay anymore, and they start to actually nibble away at the stomach lining. Now, this is all very fine when you don't have any stomach acids, but then when you're not stressed, when you go, phew, I've escaped from that lion, 
then the body then is flooded with obviously the bicarbonates and uh, stomach acids and it eats away at that now unprotected space of the stomach lining and you get basically an instant ulcer. So it's actually the knock-on effect of long sustained stress that then means that the, the, the digestion repair, the, the parasympathetic state is the thing that actually in essence is creating the ulcer. So yes, stress causes ulcers, but not. It's not actually the stress state that does it. It is a long extended period without any acids that allow these bacteria to um, have a, a field day. Uh, and it would appear again, antibiotics can treat them very easily and you can resolve that. And then this is where amino acids come in. Quite often it, it will be prescribed L-glutamine, which helps repair the stomach lining to do that, to repair that. So again, it's another of these things that stomach ulcers do not form over many months. They can, they can quite literally be formed in less than 48 hours. And presumably if your body is functioning well, because the stomach lining does repair itself very quickly, they can be resolved if treated correctly uh, in a relatively short space of time. Yeah. I don't know, as far as I'm aware, the, the antibiotics are there to, to knock out Helicobacter pylori, so that in essence they don't have a field day when you are stressed. Well, the, yeah, yes, it is sort of a, an argument. That yes, it does do the job, it stops them eating away at the lining, but the, the source problem should be to make sure you are not stressed anymore because the reason you get the acid reflux is actually because you don't have enough acids in your stomach. So what happens is the proteins aren't being broken down properly, they start to rot away in the gut, and then you end up getting an acid reflux through, which feels like acid, you get that prescribed Rennies, which then perpetuate the problem and off way you go again. But yes, the, the, the apparently the antibiotics do kill off the Halobacteria very efficiently, but it doesn't actually resolve the actual problem, is because you know, you're still gonna have a, a, a thinned, uh, but the stomach stomach cells, I think they're the fastest uh, repairing cells in the body, I think, stomach cells. So, so the body can repair it quite quickly. So assuming, assuming presumably the helibacteria has been killed off, then the stomach line can crack on and repair itself. Answer your question? Yeah? 